Joanna, uh, for putting this together and coming up with this idea rather than just canceling uh, the semester. This was her idea. Uh, and she contacted me about it. But I also want to thank Lisa Lowe. And I also want to thank my wife, Joanna Conrad, because both of these individuals were very critical in uh, understanding technology is a nice way of putting it. Uh, and they did this for free and out of the goodness of their heart just to make sure that we were able to get together and, and meet. So uh, there are many people who worked uh, to make this happen. And, and I fully appreciate everyone <coughs> that did that. Um, I wanted to start, uh, I, I had this, kind of, Joanna contacted me and she said, we have six lectures, what do you want to do? And I thought about it and I thought, well, we could just continue with what we were doing, but let's wait until we actually meet together to do that and let's kind of do a, a side project. And I thought to myself, if I had this, this quest, this mission to kind of explain what Western art was by way of six museums, yeah. what, would I, what would I actually do and where would I take people? Uh, and, and so I put together this list of, of what I think is some of my favorite locations, some of my favorite museums, and they're also and that are, are wonderful in illustrating uh, the concept of Western art. Uh, what you'll notice is, is, of course, from the list, uh, that we do not have uh, some of the major museums like the Louvre and, and other places. And it's simply because we've been there before. Uh, and I wanted to offer new content to people. I wanted to take people <clears throat> that they've never been before. Um, you'll notice on the bottom, I put my email address. Uh, you are more than welcome to contact me uh, over any questions or comments or ideas that you have about the lectures. Uh, all of the technical issues you should contact Joanna about, but if you have a question about the material, uh, then do contact me, okay? Um, I also wanted to start with this picture just as a reminder to everyone that there are some good things that are happening, and one of them is we don't have to wait in this line. <laughs> and this line, if you look at it, I have a close-up on the bottom, but it literally stretches across the screen and then goes off into the distance here with people waiting uh, to get into the Vatican Museum. Most people don't associate the, the Vatican with a museum. They usually associate it with St. Peter's uh, and the Sistine Chapel and maybe with the Raphael uh, uh, frescoes. And those are amazing pieces of art. And of course, we will be looking at those. But uh, when I visited the Vatican, the thing that I was most amazed by was the amount of other art that they had. Uh, and if you look at it, the Vatican, uh, as a museum, has the fifth largest collection of art in the world. Uh, and that's amazing to think about uh, for those of you that are, are trivia buffs that your brains are going. Uh, number one is, of course, the Louvre. Uh, number two is the Hermitage. Uh, number three would be the China National Museum. Uh, number four is the Met. And of course, number five is the Vatican. Uh, the Vatican is also the fourth uh, most frequented museum in the world, and it houses over 70,000 pieces of art. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to go through a quick history of some of the major pieces of art and talk about what they did uh, in forming their, their museum as well. I'm seeing all these wonderful faces that I haven't seen in a while, and I, I, I'm so happy to see everyone. Uh, but I, I, need to, I need to get into my lecture here. So let's get started. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so I want to start with a, a, just a map of the Vatican. And I, I think that we all know this, but I'll, I'll mention a few things. Uh, the Vatican is actually a country. Uh, it, it is a country unto itself uh, within Italy, and it has its entire grounds here. And, and I'm not sure if you can see my arrow or not, but you have the main St. Peter's. Uh, and then what you have is the series here, the yellow series or gold of buildings. And this is where the museums are. Uh, and what happens over time is we essentially start uh, with this area, what we think of as the Sistine Chapel area. And as time progresses, uh, there's more and more construction and it goes farther and farther north. Uh, the other amazing things that we have about the Vatican uh, is the Vatican over here in, in the left corner actually has its own radio station. Uh, and another very popular place that a lot of people go to uh, is the Vatican actually has its own post office as well. Uh, and a lot of people enjoy just getting uh, a little stamp from that. But as I mentioned, 
Uh, there's a rich history of art, of course, at the Vatican, but the thing that I enjoy the most about the art of the Vatican is that it's actually placed in a very artistic context. When you go to most other museums, very white walls, very kind of normal floor, but most of the work that you'll see when you look at the work of the Vatican is placed within a location where the environment is very much also suited to enjoy the art. Uh, so let's look at some work. And we start here with Pope Nicholas V in what is called the Nicoline Chapel. Uh, and this is actually a, a, something I missed when I first went to the Vatican. You always do this where you go somewhere when you're young, uh, and then when you become older, you ask yourself, why didn't I go and see this? Uh, and this is absolutely one of the things I would go and see. Uh, Friar Angelico is, is one of the most uh, important names that we have in, in what we think of as the pre-Renaissance. And uh, uh, again, he has this amazing uh, uh, chapel that was actually designed and painted by him with major renovations that occurred uh, in both 1995 and also 1996. And this is a, a beautiful piece of art. Uh, this is St. Peter consecrates St. Lawrence as deacon. And this is kind of just the lower section. And this is a, 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 the cleaned, uh, repaired version of the painting. And uh, as I mentioned, this is what we think of as the pre-Renaissance. So Friar Angelico is already taking a lot of the ideas that we will find in the Renaissance, this idea of creating a visual space that we can see with those columns going off into the distance. But we also have this sense of humanity, uh, this sense of really showing people as humans within the space uh, that they're creating. And, and Friar Angelico, uh, he was a monk and he just enjoyed painting. And he not only painted here, he painted also in Florence. And if, you, if, if you're really interested in kind of these beautiful aspects of pre-Renaissance art, I highly recommend you look at Friar Angelico. And very, very quickly, uh, just for reference here, I wanted to show what it looked like before they cleaned it. Uh, and, and we all know the Sistine Chapel was cleaned, uh, but many of these other frescoes, these beautiful frescoes that they do have uh, uh, in the Vatican have recently been cleaned. And we have an amazing story coming up in regard to that. But uh, you can see we have, it almost looks like they put a heavy chiaroscuro uh, shadowing effect on it, but this is actually just grime, uh, ash, and, and also smoke that has built up over time because of course it was a chapel. We have some of our first major pieces of art uh, under Pope Alexander VI, and uh, it's the Borga Apartments. And usually what happens is if you see a name like the Borga Apartments or a name that's kind of foreign to the conversation, it's usually just the original last name of the Pope, uh, and they've named it after that. So Pope Alexander VI, uh, last name was Borga, and the Borga apartments were created and decorated uh, by way of Alexander. And this is kind of another funny thing that happens with the Vatican, is usually you think of there being this major art director in charge of the art, uh, but in this case, it's usually just the Pope. Uh, so you kind of have this mixture uh, of how we think about art, and they kind of have their unique, unique way of doing it. Uh, he hired an artist named Pinterecchio, uh, which translates to small painter. Uh, this is another one of these unfortunate nicknames that somebody probably got over time. Uh, and this is probably the most famous scene that we have uh, from the frescoes that he created. You'll notice the gold leaf that's actually embedded in the work. And this is, uh, again, kind of what we have is the traditional uh, method of using mosaic and fresco kind of together. Probably the most interesting thing about this location uh, is the Borga apartments were used by Pope Alexander. And then the next Pope who comes along, Julius II, very famous Julius II, absolutely hated Pope Alexander uh, and decided he wanted to have nothing to do with his residence. So the Borga apartments were actually closed down for public view for a tremendous amount of time. They were reopened, but most notably, as it says in my notes, uh, beginning in 1973 under Paul VI, 
it actually becomes where they keep their contemporary art. Uh, and we'll look at some of the contemporary art of the Vatican when we get to the end of the lecture, but how amazing is that, that one of the very first places that they had artistic construction, they then turn around and use it as the contemporary house too, kind of giving this full circle of art uh, within the space of the Vatican. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very, very famous uh, uh, fresco and there's several reasons why. Uh, one, when you look at it again, it has been recently cleaned. Uh, and, and when you really look at what pin, pinch it, uh, the tiny painter, I forgot his name. Uh, when you really look at the work that he's done and the amount of detail that's kind of hidden in the background here, uh, it's absolutely amazing all these little details that they were able to pull out uh, of the, the painting itself. Uh, this is obviously a, a, a portrait of Pope Alexander there on the left. Uh, he looks like he needs a little bit of a shave, but I love the majesty of his cloak and the amount of detail that they're able to put into a fresco. And again, fresco is one of the hardest things to painting types to get exquisite detail in. So it's really amazing that this kind of unknown artist in the grander scheme of things uh, was able to do such amazing work. If you look closely, you'll notice a lion's foot on the tomb itself. The tomb is actually elevated off of the ground. Uh, the really amazing thing about this painting, and this is something that they didn't discover until after they actually had cleaned it, is this painting has what they believe is the first Western representation of Native Americans. This was done shortly after Columbus had traveled to America. And within this painting, he, uh, uh, Pinturetto actually put Native Americans as one of the details. I'm sure everyone can see them, right? <laughs> I had a lot of trouble myself, but fortunately I found an article that actually illuminates this for us. Uh, if you can see my arrow, if not, if you look right underneath where Christ is, there's a figure standing uh, in between him and the tomb. Uh, right over his shoulder is a little blurb, and in that blurb, is the Native Americans. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I had a better detail? And in fact, I do for us. But you can clearly see these individuals over the shoulder of this figure, and you'll notice the headdresses and the other pieces within them that actually type them as Native Americans. Here's another piece we have uh, from the Borga Apartments. And I think that this is another very interesting piece and it obviously is, has been done, uh, this slide has been done before the restoration, but we have San, uh, St. Sebastian in the center. Uh, and on either side, we of course have the famous archers uh, that are shooting him. But if you look at the very center, uh, it's very interesting because it almost looks like this surrealistic kind of split away where you have an image of a building that's not quite complete, but then we kind of move off into uh, what we think of as the landscape itself. So he's kind of incorporating different aspects or different pieces of the narrative uh, within the painting itself. If you look to uh, St. Sebastian's left on our right side, by this broken pillar, there is a building. And if you look very closely, uh, that would obviously be the Colosseum there in Rome. Uh, you can tell by the structuring of the building itself. And we move forward to uh, Julius II, and, and most of us already know Julius II, but if there was a, a, a list of people who influenced the world of art that weren't exactly artists themselves, uh, Julius II, Pope Julius II would probably be uh, on that list, if not number one. This is a very famous portrait that we have of him uh, that was painted by Raphael in 1511. Uh, he was a major patron for the arts of the Renaissance. Most of the major works that we associate uh, with the Renaissance there in Rome, uh, Julius II will have a hand in its creation. Uh, the wonderful thing, and I'm hoping that, that this is uh, uh, one, another wonderful thing we get by doing Zoom lectures, uh, rather than doing a presentation on a screen, is we get to see all of these wonderful details 
because we're looking at a computer. Uh, and little things, if you look at the background, this green that he has, you can see these crossed keys that are actually a part of the pattern uh, of the material that's, that's there in the background. These tiny details, again, are a major part of the work, but we kind of lose them when we're, when we're uh, uh, projecting. Uh, and of course, if you notice his rings uh, and this wonderful hand shape that Raphael is able to do, uh, we'll also notice that Julius II uh, was not a person who believed in the oath of poverty very much. Uh, he very much enjoyed kind of the, the uh, affluent lifestyle and, and his changes and his ideas that he brought to the Vatican are, are very much examples of this. So the first thing that Julius did was he developed what's called the octagonal court. Uh, and this is still in function today, as, as everything I show you will still be in function. Uh, and it is, it is exactly what it would be described as. It is an octagonal court with several archways. And what uh, Julius II actually did was he housed many of his favorite statues there in those archways. And as you can see, uh, there continues to be sculptural work present uh, in this court even to this day. The original statues that Julius had within this court have obviously been removed and put inside of the building and in some cases have actually been uh, uh, copied so that we of course can enjoy them without damaging the original. Probably the most famous statue that we have in this court area uh, that belonged to Julius II is the Laocoon group, uh, which is Laocoon, the central figure who was a priest during the Trojan War uh, and his two sons. Uh, he had a vision kind of telling uh, that the, 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 the mighty Trojan horse was of course a, a, a trap and uh, for his, his uh, vision, he was actually killed by serpents before he could warn everyone else. You gotta love ancient Greek writing. Uh, it, it's always kind of like that. Uh, but the interesting thing about these statues isn't so much when it was created, because again, the original copy came from 200 BC. Uh, this is obviously a copy that was, I believe made around 200 AD, but this was found in the Baths of Trajan, the Emperor Trajan in 1506. So this is right in the time frame that Julius II is actually emperor. Uh, and he actually sent two artists to go and look at this to ensure that one, it was a real piece of, of Roman art and not a fake, uh, and two, to secure purchase of it. One of the people that he actually sent uh, was Michelangelo. Uh, and if you know Michelangelo's work, uh, not only do most of his figures kind of look like Laocoon, uh, but if you really know his history, uh, at one point in his life, he was actually, he, he made fake Greek and Roman statuary. Uh, so he was actually probably the perfect person to send off on this, this uh, quest. This is usually counted as the first actual piece of the Vatican collection. Uh, this was put on public display uh, for people to see, and we know that it had a tremendous effect on the artist of the time, including Michelangelo. Uh, and as uh, there's actually sketches that Michelangelo has made of the Laocoon group. But not to be outdone, uh, as I mentioned, Julius II enjoyed uh, his work. Uh, he also had the Apollo Belvedere, which is another incredibly oh. important uh, statue in the conversation of art from this time. Again, this was created between 120 to 140 AD uh, and was discovered in 1508. So uh, when we think of the Renaissance, we think of all of this work kind of hearkening back to the ancient Greek and Roman period. Well, there's a very good reason for that. It's because a lot of it was being dug out of the ground right at this time period. And a lot of it was actually being put on display uh, at the Vatican during this uh, period of Julius II. Uh, the impact is, is, is can clearly be seen. Uh, the original statue is there on the left. On the right, we have an interpretation of the head that was done by a sculptor from the 1500s. Oh, you got it, okay. <laughs> huh? What? I didn't get anything. He's also responsible for uh, 
we, uh, uh, this little thing that we might have uh, talked about before on one or two occasions. Of course, Julius II is uh, most famous for the Sistine Chapel, and there's an irony of this, of course. Uh, just a reminder, if everyone can turn their microphones off, uh, uh, it, will, it will help with the lecture. Uh, the, the real irony is, of course, Julius II was responsible for bringing in Michelangelo uh, to paint the Sistine Chapel, but the Sistine Chapel is actually named after Pope Sixtus the, the, the sixth, or that's the fourth, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, and what he actually started with were these wonderful side panels that you can see on the right and left side uh, that were the original decorations of the Sistine Chapel before Michelangelo actually painted the famous Last Judgment uh, on the back wall. And of course, uh, the, the ceiling, which we will look at very, very briefly. Uh, these paintings on the side panels here, again, are a very, very important piece of pre-Renaissance art. Uh, we've got some very, very important pieces and names. This is uh, the delivery of the keys to St. Peter by Perugino, Pietro Perugino. Uh, and I'm not sure if you all can see my arrow or not, but if you look on the right side, uh, there's a figure there in a black cap standing next to a figure with a red cap. Uh, this is Perugino himself. Uh, he in, was nice enough to kind of hide himself uh, as one of the observers within the space. And uh, it's a very, very interesting composition because you've got this foreground of uh, Jesus handing the keys to St. Peter. And then behind Jesus, you actually have the apostles. Uh, and then on the right side, you have Peter and you have people who essentially were local people who were important uh, within Rome at that time. Notice the symmetry of this work, though, uh, and how it kind of plays with this asymmetrical, symmetrical sense. Uh, we have the perfect uh, building, the perfect chapel designed by Alberti there in the background, which is almost a completely symmetrical structure. And then on either side, we have an arch of triumph that kind of lends to this idea, again, of the symmetry. Uh, if you look at the figures in the, ground, in the foreground, again, the symmetrical idea, but the more we look at it, it's not symmetrical at all. Of course, the groups of figures are different, but when we look at the background, we have this larger group there to the left side and kind of people in activity there on the right. Uh, this actually plays into more classical notions that we'll, we'll pick up on uh, a little bit later on in the lecture. Another very famous painting that we have uh, from these series, these side panels, uh, is actually a painting by Botticelli, uh, who actually went to uh, Rome with a large group of other artists from Florence uh, and did these kind of paintings. This is very interesting uh, because it shows kind of how they looked at work and did work uh, before the Renaissance. And what I mean by that is if you really look at this, it's almost a challenge to count the number of times that you'll find Moses within this painting. Uh, this is described as young, uh, the youth of Moses or the trials of Moses. And uh, what it is, is it explains kind of the early parts of his life. Uh, we start in the bottom corner with Moses actually with a sword there assaulting someone. And then behind him, he will actually be going off uh, to the desert. Uh, throughout the narrative, we again see all of these different instances of his life. Uh, and we go all the way forward to the very, very far left here, uh, where he is actually leading uh, the, the, the Jews out of Egypt. Uh, and again, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, idea of looking very contemporary, even though, uh, again, they're supposed to be people from the ancient world. And of course, we have to talk about the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, but the problem is that I could literally spend an entire lecture series uh, just talking about this one piece of art. And, and in my opinion, uh, it is really one of the major masterpieces uh, that's ever been created by a human being. Uh, there are, of course, the kind of complaints about it that everybody looks like uh, they came from Muscle Beach, whether depending doesn't doesn't even matter your gender. Uh, the women look as incredibly muscular as the men do. Uh, but for the work that it is and what it was able to create for the time, uh, there really are a few things that will be in the same ballpark in my mind uh, in terms of creation. Uh, and again, this is a beautiful version, a beautiful image of it. 
uh, where it has been recently cleaned uh, and the effects and the beauty of it are, are just overwhelming. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't want to spend too much time with the ceiling because, again, we could go on forever with this, but we have to, at least for a quick moment, uh, look at the real masterpiece, which is the creation of Adam uh, by Michelangelo. And I, I, the thing, there are so many wonderful things about this and how he's created it. Uh, again, we've got this very, very typical Michelangelo figure, again, looking like he's related to Lyakawan, if you will, uh, in the form of Adam and the outstretched hand, of course, uh, reaching towards God and this moment that they're almost touching. Probably the thing that I love the most about this is how Michelangelo envisioned God himself uh, wearing a Roman tunic, of course, but I love this idea that it almost looks like God isn't even moving by himself, but is in fact uh, surrounded by this throng of angels uh, that are dictating and almost moving with him with every single small thing that he's doing. Uh, and you've got this wonderful extra cloak that's forming almost this portal, if you will, to another sense of reality. Uh, very often in a lot of conversation, you'll hear about this woman, uh, and we don't know for sure who she is. There's a lot of ideas. She could be Sophia, uh, this concept of wisdom that was very, very popular in the ancient world. I'm sure you all have heard of the Hagia Sophia, uh, the building itself. Uh, this might be an allusion to her, but to be honest, we really have no direct idea of who Michelangelo wanted this woman to be. She could be Eve too, right? <laughs> and we move on to the Raphael rooms, uh, again constructed by Julius II. And this is a case where, uh, again, we just had Alexander uh, do these wonderful rooms and Julius hated that man so much that he refused to live in the Borga apartments and instead picked a new place in the Vatican and had Raphael uh, and Raphael's people come and create it. Now, the interesting thing about the Raphael rooms is they're created between 1508 to 1524. Uh, Julius II only lives till 1513. Uh, so it's actually the Raphael rooms span between Julius II uh, and Pope Leo X, who is one of the uh, Medici group uh, there from Florence. The other interesting thing about about it is that Raphael actually dies in 1520, uh, which makes this, I believe, the only piece of art, the only grouping of art uh, that was created by two popes and was continued uh, well after the artist had himself passed on. Uh, this is, of course, the most famous room. If you look on the right side, uh, on the right side of what's that small alcove, you can actually see a portal of Julius II there. Uh, but of course, the, the thing, the real masterpiece that everyone looks at uh, is the painting there on the left. And this is of course, uh, the beautiful school of a uh, Athens. One of the more amazing things that we have uh, actually from Julius II isn't just his bringing in of Michelangelo and Raphael, to create these masterpieces of art, uh, but he really had a hands-off approach towards his artists. And this is rather unique for the time period. He's one of the few patrons that essentially said, I trust that you will do the best that you can and create something beautiful, and I'm just going to let you do that. Uh, this is another one of these paintings that I could, I could spend an entire lecture going through the various parts, but very much like the Perugino image that we saw, we have this allusion to both symmetry and asymmetry at the same time. If you look at this beautiful arcade that Raphael has constructed, uh, this is this sense of symmetry, but the more we look at the individual figures, we see that they're obviously not in any symmetrical uh, grouping uh, uh, at all. Uh, very famous figures are also placed within uh, the painting itself. Uh, the figure on the left in armor, this is of course Alexander the Great. Uh, if you look at the very center, we have two figures. This is Plato and Aristotle, and very famously, this alludes to their ideas of philosophy. Uh, we have the image of Plato, who is thought to be an image actually of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, pointing to the heavens, and if you know Platonic 
philosophy. It's the idea of ideals, that there are these things beyond our understanding that are that of perfection. Next to him, we of course have Aristotle who is pointing at the ground saying that again, beauty and ideas of ideal actually exist within the world, uh, not within the heavens like we thought before. In the foreground, uh, we have this brooding figure and this has often been denoted uh, of course as Michelangelo. Now, I always have to pause for just a second and, and remember that we're in the Vatican. We're in essentially uh, uh, the central part of the Catholic Church. And this is where the Pope lives. And he has a painting of the School of Athens kind of denouting the different ideas of classical philosophy. Uh, that's very bizarre to think about. And it's very interesting because we have this, which kind of represents the Greek world, the Greek Roman world of philosophical ideas, but then paired across from it, uh, Raphael put the distribution of the Holy Sacrament. And it, it's again, we don't, uh, uh, we have kind of this mixture of spacing where before we were inside a space and here we're just outside. Uh, and we have this wonderful arc around the image of Christ, uh, again with different important figures. If you look right next to him, he of course has Mary uh, and Saint John and underneath him uh, a, 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 a dove to indicate the Holy Spirit. Some of the other rooms that he did, and we're going to kind of go through these rather quickly, uh, the more that we continue uh, uh, chronologically, the less that Raphael actually has a hand uh, in the creation of the work. Uh, the room of Heliodorus is the next room chronologically that we have. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the beautiful thing about the Vatican isn't just the art, but it's the space within the art itself. Again, this is an entire enclosure. The floor even has a part to do uh, with the work itself. If you think of those archways, and again, those kind of arches that we have on the floor, they mirror each other. They give us the sensation of wholeness within the space. And this is another work that has recently been redone, uh, but we do have a, another portrait of Julius II there on the left, uh, this time high up on a, a chair that is being carried by individuals. And from the room of Heliodorus, I think is really one of the, the, the masterpieces of fresco. Uh, that, that it, it boggles my mind every time I see this work. Because again, this is fresco. This is the idea that you're taking wet plaster and you're applying pigment within it in order to create the image. How do you do that by creating an image and then putting a, a grating in front of it or a bars like he has here in the center and still have this be full of illumination? I'm not sure if he went through and did one image and then created over the top, but the complexity of this central image with the angel uh, talking and delivering St. Peter uh, with the bars in front of it and the individual sleeping shoulder, uh, soldiers, excuse me, uh, is, is as an artist is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen just in terms of pure technique. And a few more of the rooms. This is the third room called the Fire in the Borgo. And this is actually where we're transferring over uh, to the time of Leo X rather than Julius II. Uh, we know this because of the inclusion of uh, many of these paintings are about Leo IV, which is a, a, a person that Leo X kind of admired. Uh, if we look on the left side here on this panel, uh, this is the actual Fire of Borgo. Uh, and this is the image itself. And if you look in the distance in the, in the, uh, the balcony there, that is Leo IV kind of putting out a blessing in order to calm down the fire. Uh, you have these different kind of figures within there. Uh, most famously down in the left corner, you've got this figure who's thought to be Aeneas, again, kind of saving his father, if you're familiar with that story. Uh, and this is always kind of makes me laugh a little bit because his father has this hat <laughs> on uh, that always looks like he might have stolen it from Santa Claus. Uh, and I always get a little bit of a chuckle whenever I see that figure. 
Now I mentioned the fact that we have, we, we know that this was done during uh, the time period of Leo X, not just because of the inclusion of Leo IV, but when we look at some of the work, uh, like this very famous piece, the Battle of Ostia, and this is the Battle of Ostia from 849. Uh, this was of course painted much, much later uh, during the same period as the other ones. If you look at the figure there on the left, this is a painting of Leo IV, but if you really look at the man's face, the face is that of Leo X. So Leo has actually kind of swapped his face with a previous pope uh, in order to kind of give himself a little bit more oomph, if you will, uh, within the guise of this classical painting. It couldn't hurt when you put your patron's face in there, I suppose, but it, it's, it's kind of an odd thing. And the last group of rooms that we have is called the Room of Constantine. And most of this was constructed after the death of Raphael uh, and has lost, in my, my opinion, uh, kind of the magic that you have with Raphael. Uh, Raphael had this tremendous ability to put a lot of figures in one scene, but you still have this tremendous sense of clarity from it. Uh, if you think of the School of Athens and all of the different figures that are in that painting, it's a jumble, but yet there's still this amazing sense of clarity there. And you can still very much identify who each of the figures are. Uh, when we get to the Room of Constantine, not quite so much. Uh, probably the most famous painting that we have uh, is there on the right wall, uh, and this is the Battle of Millivan Bridge. And this is Constantine versus Maxentius. And, and obviously it needs to be clean, but this is a tremendous battle scene uh, and is impressive to me, if nothing else, for the amount of figures that they were able to register in one single fresco. Uh, the famous Millivan Bridge is here, uh, and we can see Constantine here in the center. And this is, of course, this moment uh, when Constantine sees uh, essentially a, a cross in the light and in the sky uh, and puts it on his battle standards and they lead into a, a hopeless battle, uh, but they win anyway. And this is thought to be the first moment that Christianity becomes a part of essentially the Roman Empire in terms of the emperors. Uh, there had long been Christians, of course, in there before, but uh, usually they, they were persecuted. Constantine changes that, of course, and it will eventually adopt Christianity as his own faith. One of the other rooms that Raphael did uh, that many people don't know about is actually the Room of Chiaroscuro. Uh, and this is a room where you have a lot of kind of faux paintings and faux architecture painted within it. And I think that's kind of the, the overall point of it is you have these shadows of the figures and the statues and, and you're supposed to walk into the room uh, and think that everything is, is real, but in fact, nothing in this room is real and everything is, is just a painting on a wall. I love this space and I think this is so interesting. We're going through all of these different popes uh, and with, I think with each of them, you get a kind of a, a little flavor of their personality uh, by what they chose to commission uh, in terms of art. We have Julius II, who did all of these wonderful humanitarian pieces. Uh, and then we, of course, have uh, uh, Leo come along and, and praise himself. But then we get to Gregory, uh, and Gregory creates the Gallery of Maps in 1581. And this is a project that he came up with where over 40 paintings, he wanted to show all of the landscape of Italy. He wanted a complete understanding of topographically of what Italy was within the space of one hallway. Uh, and it's absolutely amazing. It's 120 meters long, which registers at 393 feet. It's a little bit longer than a football field counting both end zones. Massive, massive space. Uh, and it's only 19 feet wide. Uh, and I think this is another thing that I honestly missed when I went to the Vatican, but would love to go back and see because it has all of these wonderful kind of quaint paintings on the walls that you can see but we also have all of this wonderful extra work that was done. Uh, if we remember Pentragino, our tiny painter, he actually did a lot of these detailed paintings and then they came back through and actually painted the maps. 
Uh, and again, some of these map paintings are, are pretty remarkable, uh, in my opinion. Again, this is a fresco that was painted on the wall. This is someone's attempt at showing the topography, the mountains, and, and uh, uh, all of the uh, work within Italy itself. So you have paintings like this one, uh, but then you have other paintings like this one, which are just kind of these quaint little landscapes uh, that are very unrealistic, but have found their way into uh, the Hall of the Maps. So what happens next is we have two different popes who kind of work in coordination, uh, Clement and Pius, uh, and they found the Pio Clementi, uh, Clementino, uh, Clementino excuse me, uh, uh, museum. And what this is, is this is a collection of Greek and Roman sculpture from 1770, or it was established in 1771. And a lot of this was just taking a lot of the sculpture that had, had, had already been there, Julius II, again, uh, a lot of his work, and putting it in one single place. Uh, this is probably, if you are interested in sculpture from ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, this is the site that you really need to go to because there's such an amazing collection of some of the more important pieces uh, within that conversation. And I just wanted to remind everyone of the term contrapposto, uh, and my, my, my thing is blocked here, so I'm, I'm going to paraphrase my definition. Uh, contrapposto is this classical posture that they had started in Greece and made its way to Rome, uh, where you're showing a body active and calm at the same time. We have the very famous uh, figure there in the center of the Dori Foros, uh, which is the perfect example of what contrapposto is. And I've split the figure up. So if you look on uh, the left side, you'll see the figure, this side is in motion. And if you look at the right here, this side is at rest. And together we have this figure that is contrapposto. Uh, I wanted to bring this up because the vast majority of statues we look at rely on this basic concept this basic posturing uh, uh, within sculptural, uh, figurative sculpture. Uh, and this is one of the, again, all of these statues are incredibly important and famous that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, and many of them have their own mini videos online that you can learn specifically uh, about these statues. Again, uh, here's a beautiful Hermes statue that was originated from between 76 and 138 AD, uh, but was discovered and brought to the collection in 1543. I'm, I'm probably going to get this one wrong. This is called the Apoxiomenos. Uh, and this is actually a, a, a statue that was originated by Lysippus, who is a Greek sculptor. It was originally done in bronze, uh, and several of the, the uh, Roman emperors were so enchanted with it that they kind of, it survived as a bronze much longer than most of the statues do uh, in ancient Rome. They, of course, had this habit of taking their bronze statues and melting them down uh, and making stone copies uh, uh, out of them before, of course, they melted them down. So what we're looking at is a copy, uh, but again, this is a pretty ancient copy. Uh, and what it, it, uh, Apoxiomenos actually translates out to the scraper. And if you notice his hand posturing, what he's actually doing here, uh, athletes in ancient Greece, we, I think we all know this, uh, used to uh, compete completely naked. And not only were they completely naked, they would oil up their bodies. Uh, right, okay. Uh, and so what he's doing here uh, is after you competed for a while, you would have this oil on your body. And if you can think of someone like running on a dirt track or something like that, what would happen is the dust and the debris uh, would, would get stuck on your body because of all of the oil. So what they would do uh, after they competed is they would scrape off this kind of grime off of their body. And that's where the term, uh, the scraper actually comes from. If you look at his body though, uh, and again, we go back to that idea of contrapposto, uh, Lysippus was thought to be really the perfection of the concept of contrapposto. If you look at how easily he kind of puts this figure at rest in motion at the same time, but it evenly blends together, uh, he really was a master. And again, uh, he was from ancient Greece. And we see the direct effects of having all of this ancient Greco-Roman sculpture uh, in works like uh, Antonio Canova's uh, from 18, 1800 
Perseus Triumphant, which very much looks like something that you would have found in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, but was of course created in 1800 uh, rather than uh, from that period. And within the museum that they created itself, the architecture uh, is absolutely amazing. In 1505, we have Bramante creating his famous double helix design staircase, uh, which you can still access today. But amazingly, uh, there was a modern recreation of this. And I think many of you have seen this before, this absolutely amazing staircase based on the idea of a double helix that was created in 1932 by Giuseppe Momo. Uh, again, relying on the, the, the ideas of Bramante, but creating kind of a contemporary version of it. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through kind of these next images rather quickly, but essentially what we have is this massive collection of Greco-Roman work, but also work that we have that was created uh, as copies. And, and this is kind of the wonkiness of the Vatican is what they actually do uh, is they just kind of throw everything in one room. Uh, so you'll walk into a room like this and what you'll actually be seeing, and I, I think this is an amazing idea, the Hall of Animals is just a space full of animals uh, of, of different variety. It's like a stone zoo that they've essentially created. But as I was mentioning, within this one space, you'll have pieces that actually go back to ancient Rome. Then you'll have pieces that were repaired from ancient Rome. Then you'll have modern copies from that time all in the same space, and it's not always clear what you're exactly looking at. So we have the Hall of Animals, and, and again, I'm going to go through these rather quickly. Uh, we then have the Hall of Muses. And I, I think you, I mean, you can see kind of the, the beauty, and as I mentioned before, this kind of integration that we have with the work and the space. Uh, you can go to many places and see uh, this wonderful sculpture, but not in kind of this location. And, and I think that's one of the attractive things about the Vatican. Here we have the round hall uh, and that beautiful, beautiful fountain that is located in the center was actually located in the middle of a Roman town. Uh, the beautiful mosaics that you have on the bottom are recreations of mosaics that were originally created in the second and third century uh, and were recreated by the artists when they were constructing this building. Here we have the Gallery of Statues, a uh, very appropriately named space. And here we have the Cabinet of Masks. And I got a little giggle because I, a, a few of our members were showing off their masks beforehand. And I thought, uh, what a nice segue, but uh, not a very good named room, obviously. <laughs> I'm not seeing a cabinet or any masks. But uh, again, you can see these kind of recreations of wonderful sculptures. Uh, this, if you look at the image of these three women here on the very, very far left, this will actually lend itself to a Raphael painting much later of the muses. In addition, we have some original uh, uh, mosaic fresco there, or excuse me, just mosaic on the ground, uh, you can usually tell the original pieces because they have some type of guardrail uh, established around them. Uh, the Gallery of the Candelabra. And here we see the just overall <laughs> abundance uh, of this sculpture. And we move on to our next Pope, which is Pope Pius VII. And the Caramonte Museum uh, is what we're essentially looking at. He's also responsible for another thing that we'll look at called the New Wing. But there's actually a story behind why this was created. Uh, if you look at the time period, what essentially happens is you have the Vatican with this massive collection of art. And then you have this certain gentleman by the name of Napoleon uh, show up in town. Uh, and Napoleon very much enjoyed art too. So what Napoleon did was he took a tremendous amount of the Vatican's collection, sculpture, and also paintings, uh, which had started to be collected at this time as well. 
back to France. Uh, after Napoleon waned from power, many of his art pieces were returned. And in this case, you have this massive amount of sculpture that was essentially returned all at once to the Vatican. And they essentially just made this new wing uh, in order to, to house it. Uh, and you can see the effect. Again, this tremendous overflowing uh, of classical uh, Greco-Roman sculpture. It's also during uh, Pius that we have the first regulations of the Vatican Museum uh, installed. And this had a lot to do with teams of conservationists that he had brought in that were being interfered with, with people actually enjoying the work. And this is called the New Wing, which was created as this tribute to uh, the, the perfect idea of the place setting for classical Greco-Roman sculpture. Uh, and, and you can see the beautiful limes or the beautiful marble that they have within it uh, and several very interesting statues. Probably the most interesting to me uh, is this reclining statue there on the left. And this is actually a statue of the Nile, a personification of the river. But what a fun statue. You've got this wonderful gentleman again uh, with our Lea. It almost looks like Leiakouan taking a break from his other work, uh, reclining there. We've got that full body uh, again, but all of these wonderful little children and babies kind of playing around him. Uh, and, and that to me is just kind of the magic of this work that somebody had to design all of these small children to kind of interact with uh, this giant statue of the Nile and, and in some ways really, really fun childlike ways. You'll notice this tiny one on his shoulder that looks like he's essentially playing with the hair of the Nile himself. Uh, you'll also notice that he's leaning on a sphinx uh, and this is an important character when we look at our next figure. And again, put this strongly in your mind because this is another wonderful thing you get from the Vatican's collection is you realize how much Greco and Roman artists just copied each other. <laughs> this is another statue of the Nile uh, and it looks incredibly similar to what we saw just before, but the absence of, of course, the small children. But you'll notice that that Sphinx, that Sphinx figure is in the exact same location uh, that we had previously. I'll go back really fast and you can see what I'm talking about. Exact same location. Probably the most important figure that we have uh, in this collection is the Augustus of Prima Porta. Uh, and this is a statue that was uh, 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 from Prima Porta, from Livia, who uh, was, was uh, his wife, yes, uh, her, her essentially her summer home. Uh, again, this is a figure that's rich in contrapposto, even though if you look at his knees, uh, he has contrapposto right here, the bent knee and the straight knee. And here we have a small cupid kind of giving him this allusion back to Aeneas, uh, uh, kind of the founder of Rome, if you will. Uh, Aeneas had a connection to Venus and Venus, of course, has a connection to Cupid. This is one of my favorite sculptures from the ancient world, not just because it shows uh, uh, this figure of Augustus, but if you really look at his chest plate, it's really a sculpture within a sculpture. You've got the figure, but on his chest plate, he has three distinct areas. He has the sky, he has the earth itself with a figure kind of giving back a battle standard to a different Roman soldier. And then on the bottom, he kind of has the underworld. So not only does Augustus have this connection to the gods of the time, on his chest, he literally has the entire universe, the heavens, the earth, and the underworld uh, there uh, 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 present. Uh, and if you've, you've seen my lectures and you've seen me talk about this statue before, this is one of my favorite statues because we actually have some idea of what it looked like in ancient Rome. There were little paint flakes that were left on it and they put it back together. And, and I've shown this before, but I always love showing it. Uh, this is what the statue originally looked like. Uh, very, very bright colors and context. Again, probably painted in flesh tones. And if you think about those halls that we just went through, and if you can imagine in your mind all of these same statues, but painted like this, rather than this wonderful classic noble uh, uh, stoneware that we have, this marble, uh, it probably would have a very different feel. Pope Gregory uh, comes in 1831, and he starts two very important museums. One is 
Uh, I'm going to translate here the Etruscan Museum, and the second is the Egyptian Museum. Uh, the Etruscans, if you're not familiar, were a group of people who lived in Rome essentially before the Romans. They were a different group, like a different tribe is kind of a good way to think of them. They were contemporary with the ancient Greeks, uh, and a lot of their work not only is important to them, but is important to ancient Greece. Uh, this is a, 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 a just a small metal piece, bronze piece, that we have from their culture. Uh, and we actually have surviving bronze pieces despite the Romans' best efforts uh, from the Etruscan culture. And this is probably the most important thing that we have. This is a Greek vase that was created between 540 and 530 uh, by Ezekius. And we know this because his name is actually signed on the, the, the piece of ceramics itself. Uh, we get a large, we get a massive amount of ancient Greek ceramic ware from the Etruscans who actually traded with the ancient Greeks. So we know a lot about ancient Greek ceramics from the Etruscans who actually lived there in Rome. Uh, very quickly, there are many videos just about this piece, but this shows an amazing idea of composition as early as 540 uh, BC. This is the idea of Achilles and Ajax uh, playing a board game. And if you look, the board is actually here, and that's our focal point. But if you look what Ezekiel has actually done within this space, we had the arms outstretched, leading our eyes there. But look at how he places these spears. And this is really phenomenal for somebody who's creating art in 540 BC. These spears, again, lead us right back to the center of the composition, this idea of this game that these two are actually engaged within. Probably the most important piece that we have uh, from the Etruscans, other than the Ezekiel piece, is this, the Mars of Todai. Uh, and this is a full bronze statue. Uh, it is a little bit smaller than life size, uh, but again, it is a full bronze statue from the Etruscans. And uh, again, you can kind of see this contrapposto uh, even within his, his, his stance, even though his legs are a little bit more active. But again, uh, uh, it's incredible to think that we have a piece of bronze that goes back this early uh, that has actually survived. As I mentioned, uh, Gregory also started the Egyptian Museum, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not going to show us too much from this because I think a lot of us know what Egyptian works look like, but I found this one piece that is absolutely amazing uh, in their collection. It's called the Shroud of the Lady of the Vatican, and what this is, is this is a piece of linen that is hand-painted that they would lay on top of a mummy uh, within the space of a sarcophagus. Uh, you can see it's, it's not in very good shape, but there are only six of these in the entire world uh, that have been found and preserved. And this is one of the few copies that is actually on display uh, that the public can see. So we move forward to Pius XI, and I mentioned this, we have this massive collection of paintings uh, within the scope of the Vatican at this time. So they created what's known as the Vatican Picture Gallery from 1932. Uh, and this is worth a trip unto itself because the art that's in this is some of the most amazing art by some of the most amazing artists imaginable, uh, and it's all in one space. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to go through some of the highlights. We have this wonderful triptych that's done by Giotto, and, and Giotto is most famous, uh, of course, for doing uh, his frescoes in, in Padua, but this is a piece he did before that, but it's an excellent example of what art looked like pre-Renaissance. Again, we have gold leaf everywhere. We've got uh, very, very stiff figures. You'll notice how uh, the heroic scale is the term that they use uh, for the size of Jesus in comparison to the people around him. We have Leonardo da Vinci's Saint Jerome in the Wilderness. Uh, and there's always a debate as to whether or not this was finished or whether it just kind of faded out over time. Uh, it's very hard. At first, you don't even notice this, but there's actually a lion here in the foreground who has been so muted out, it just kind of looks like a white blotch now. Uh, but you can definitely see his tail kind of curving around.
you remember Pietro Perugino uh, uh, from the Sistine Chapel? This is one of his paintings. And I use this, uh, if nothing else, as an example. This is referred to as the Florentine style of presenting the Madonna. Uh, and what it is, you'll see this over and over again. She's sitting on a throne, usually surrounded by about four people, but she has either an atrium or a can canopy over her, uh, giving her this sense of enclosure. Again, this is a very common thing that you'll see in Florentine paintings. Uh, you'll see this kind of basic composition over and over and over again. And that's why it's such a big deal that Raphael changes things. Uh, and I have a few Raphael paintings to, to enjoy, but uh, honestly, I think that these are some of the most beautiful paintings uh, ever created. Most of these I actually have splits on, so I'm going to show you this, but then we're going to look a little bit closer uh, at the details because most of these work better if you kind of split them in half. Uh, here we have Mary, of course, in heaven uh, being crowned by Jesus, and I, this is just the most human face imaginable uh, for Jesus. It is a very unique thing because he's really kind of almost the sense of discovery uh, uh, with the crown itself. Uh, and you always have to love the little pooty angels that he's put around. Uh, in particular, this one down at the bottom here, uh, kind of hiding in Jesus's cloaks, who honestly looks completely bored to death uh, in this situation. And then underneath, we of course have the apostles looking up uh, 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 at the, at the uh, um, <clears throat> while Mary is being put within the tomb. Uh, if you look very closely at this, I always wonder if this figure who's directly behind uh, the tomb and this figure that's over here on the right might have been the same model. Uh, they look like they might have been twin brothers, uh, if you will, the man in the orange and then this man directly behind standing by himself. Underneath that painting, we actually have the Predalas too, which are the small paintings on the bottom. Uh, these aren't the most amazing paintings until you look at the size of them. Uh, this entire composition is only 50 centimeters long. Uh, so it's amazing to me that Raphael was able to get as much detail as he was uh, within this tiny composition. And here we have the Annunciation. Uh, but again, look at the space that he's created there. And this adds to kind of this three-dimensional effect that you will have on the painting above it. And here we have the presentation in the temple. Again, the third panel uh, on the bottom of the painting we just looked at. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite Raphael paintings because I think that, that he just puts together so many amazing things. Again, we don't have that canopy over Mary. She's sitting on a cloud bank with this beautiful kind of moon behind her. Uh, we'll go ahead and look at the details here. First at the top because it, it, it just, it, it boggles the mind how much beauty is in this. And not only do you have this tremendous scene with Mary uh, and, and Jesus. And I always love it when people paint Jesus looking like a baby and doing baby things like he very much is here. And it looks like Mary's kind of just playing with him. But I'm sure you all have noticed, look at the clouds and look at all of these little cherubs that he painted just as clouds in and around Mary herself. Absolutely amazing kind of concept or idea to include this kind of throng of heaven uh, uh, around Mary. And on the bottom, again, very, very beautiful. And we've got that, the, 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 the orb on the top of, of the sun or the moon. And if you look very, very carefully, there's actually a rainbow there in the background. And that accents that beautiful orb that we have at the top. Uh, we've got our four figures here. On the left, we've got St. John and St. Francis. Uh, and then we have Conte, who is actually the man who paid for this painting, and St. Jerome. And I love St. Jerome because if you look at St. Jerome very carefully, hidden down here uh, in his cloak is this little smudge. But if you look very, very closely, this is the famous lion that we will, of course, always see with St. Jerome.
just a couple more here, uh, but we have to look at the transfiguration. Again, this painting that I think signals very much the Baroque of, of the, the period of art that comes after the Renaissance. I say that because of the very thick darkness that we have on the bottom. This is an interesting painting because the majority of these I've been splitting kind of 50-50, but I tried to do that with this and I kind of realized that this painting follows what we would think of as the golden mean structure. Uh, if you look at the line of separation, it's much closer to about a third of the way up on the composition rather than being directly in the middle. And again, when we look at the details of the painting, absolutely amazing. Uh, this image that, that many people have copied throughout time of the rising of Christ and, and his arms outstretched. He has a very, very flattened face, which I think kind of adds uh, uh, to, to his image, but this light that's essentially emanating out of him. And then you look at the rest of the work and you kind of fall away into darkness. Uh, and this is especially true when we get to the bottom and this very much looks like something from the Baroque period. You've got these figures in and out of darkness. Uh, look at the facial expressions of some of these people that Raphael is painting uh, within this space. Again, this is kind of the signal that art is changing uh, and we'll have a different group of artists essentially adopting a lot of these new ideas coming up next. Uh, this is a Titian painting, another Madonna painting. Uh, but you will notice as we split this, again, a very, very beautiful rendition of Mary at the top uh, with her two angel assistants. And then there at the bottom, another beautiful painting. I love how Titian, most likely his workshop, honestly, uh, did uh, the, the vestments here. And the fact that you, in these details, you can see these wonderful figures within the vestment of, of uh, the, the priest or the Pope there. And of course, we have San Sebastian there in the corner, uh, a figure easily recognized with his arrows uh, in his body. Veronese's uh, Visions of St. Helen. This was Constantine's mother. But look at the beautiful uh, uh, inlay on the cloak or, or her cloak and all of this wonderful detail. This is really when I think oil painting uh, is reaching its mastery uh, uh, within Italy. And this, of course, leads to one of my personal favorite artists, Caravaggio, uh, and his very famous entombment. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is another one of these paintings I could talk at at great length, uh, how the figures slowly kind of erase into the darkness, how he kind of gives us a different sensation of mourning from each of the figures. The realism that he always imparts on his paintings, even to the chagrin of, of the people looking at it, like the dirt on Jesus's feet, uh, things like this are what make Caravaggio the master of the Baroque period. And this is always uh, one of his just most amazing paintings. And I wanted to just pause for a second because I'm always amazed by this. You go back to 1330 and Giotto and people were painting like this. Uh, and then within the space of what, about 250 years, we've changed, humanity has changed and we've gone from this type of image of an entombment to something like this. Uh, and, and that's amazing to think about that, that the, how much that changes within that slow, that small period. And I think that a lot of the works that we've seen along the way kind of fill in the gaps between these two works. The last thing I wanted to look at uh, is actually the collection of modern religious art uh, that was added in 1973 uh, by Pope uh, Paul VI. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, this is in the Borgia apartments that were pretty much unused uh, until this time, but it's interesting because you've got this rather contemporary art, but then on the ceiling, uh, you again have frescoes that go all the way back to about 1500 or so. And some of the work within this is, is really kind of amazing. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, when I was a, a student and I was traveling Europe, I was absolutely amazed by the modern collection at the Vatican. Something you wouldn't think of, but 
look at some of the work that they have there. Uh, Vincent van Gogh's Pieta. Uh, this is a painting that he did multiple copies of based on the Delacroix print that we have there on the right. This was painted very, very late in his life. Uh, there are two separate paintings, two separate versions of this painting that you can see. The larger one there on the left uh, is the one that the, the Vatican owns, and the one there on the right uh, is the copy that is actually owned by the Van Gogh Museum. We have some of the early images that Matisse did uh, in connection with his famous chapel that he created uh, for the nurse that cared with him while he was recovering uh, from bad health. Some of these original designs, uh, uh, again, are in part of the Vatican. And the interesting thing about these is the vast majority of these images, if not all of them, were all donated to the church. Uh, the Vatican doesn't go out and, and buy contemporary pieces of art. Uh, this is all things that people have given to the church. Uh, very famous James, uh, James Ensor, uh, uh, kind of our first outsider artist, but the procession of the penitents. Uh, and again, we have to be kind of, it's kind of remarkable that they have an image like this and then they have some of the, you know, classical Greco-Roman sculpture uh, uh, that has really influenced an entire generation of artists. Continuing, uh, Marc Chagall's painting on the left. Uh, this is Christ and the Painter. Uh, uh, and uh, if you don't know Marc Chagall, he's a very interesting figure. He is, of course, Jewish, but he uses the image of Christ in Christian imagery iconography quite a bit within his work. Uh, to me, though, and I included the, the Gauguin painting, I can't look at this and not think that he was looking at Gauguin's very famous yellow Christ that I've also featured there on the right. This isn't in the Vatican's collection, but I wanted to do this wonderful comparison for us. We have Salvador Dali's uh, Annunciation, the Trinity. And this is a pre-painting that he did uh, to this other painting there that I have on the right, a much larger, more complete canvas. And you can see in the smaller one, this, these echoes that we'll find in the painting itself. Uh, I looked at this and originally I saw the the Trinity, and I, I thought Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I tried to work this out, but he actually has done this differently. This is actually the Annunciation. This is uh, Gabriel talking to Mary uh, with the image of Christ kind of being transferred over to her. Uh, and what an interesting painting, an interesting way to paint these individuals. Again, both Mary and Gabriel don't really have faces. And in fact, Gabriel almost looks like he's slipping off into the ether uh, within his design. And I love that he's, he's presenting this full image of Christ as the Annunciation. Usually you see this little tiny uh, a dove that's being transferred between the two. Here it's a full-size human being uh, that's going between the two of them. And of course, you'll also notice that Gabriel has the cross uh, there in his hand as well. They have an early study by Francis Bacon. Uh, of his study for the Velasquez Pope. And I've included, this is not Francis Bacon's, this is uh, the Velasquez painting, uh, I believe of Innocence X. Uh, and this is uh, Francis Bacon's copy of it. Uh, he has done multiple versions of the Pope. Probably the most famous uh, is his screaming Pope. Uh, and it really kind of boggles my mind that the Vatican would have any paintings by Francis Bacon, but I think it really says something about their collection. And we also have incredibly contemporary pieces of art like this one. Uh, this is just an abstract, non-objective form uh, that frankly was created out of tar. Uh, this was during a time period of art where essentially the materials that you put into the work mean as much as what you're creating, but this is in the Vatican's collection. This beautiful piece of abstract art that again, you would kind of be hard pressed to find the direct connection that it has to Catholicism. Uh, this is pretty much the end of what I have. I noticed I've gone very long. This is the problem with me being at home is I just babble endlessly. Uh, but I wanted to end with this comparison. Uh, and this is the comparison uh, of the painting we just looked at. Uh, and of course, Layakawan. And to me, I actually see parallels between these two. 
but I think it's a wonderful way of summing up uh, the work of the Vatican. Thank you all very, very much. I really appreciate this. <laughs> and I can hear nobody. It's so strange. <laughs>